Thank you very much for those very kind words. Uh, I, I will give uh, a few thoughts uh, on what we have gone through in Sweden over the last uh, uh, 20 years, but I will also share my views on, on the European situation and, and also give you uh, some, some, uh, uh, some views on where we are currently heading uh, for, for years to come. Uh, let me start out with the, the current situation in Sweden. Uh, we have done reasonably well during this crisis. Uh, our debt has actually decreased during the crisis and we are at a debt level that is, is not a major problem in the economy anymore. But the, de the debt issue is, is not something that is, is really uh, influencing the, the economic policy choices that, that we have, have to make. And that is for a small open economy where interest rate spreads are, ha has been haunting us for the last 10 to 15 years, a, a, a major change. This is the first crisis when uh, global bond markets have not exploded in, in, in Sweden when, when there has been turmoil. At, as, as, as late as in the dot-com crisis, we actually had a credibility issue that forced the Riksbank to intervene in the currency market uh, and, and hike rates during a, a period of, of, of slowdown. So the, the fact that the debt issue is off from the agenda is, is something that is, is very, very good for us. My reading of the uh, problems that we're now seeing in Europe is that Basically, it was a fiscal problem. We will obviously spend a decade to, to dissect in what dimension it was a fiscal problem, but now we are seeing a European uh, uh, area, euro area with a debt level that is uh, stabilizing this year and actually decreasing in the years to come, according to the IMF forecast. We have an average deficit of 3.2 in the eurozone and 2.7 next year. So the fiscal side of the European stuff is basically, I think, being dealt with. Uh, obviously, uh, contingent on the fact that all of these plans are now implemented and, and, and that there is no major slippage. And I don't think the, the lack of, of credibility for these plans has to do with the numbers. It is not a problem whether uh, Spain has 3 or 3.2 or 3.5 in, in deficit in, in 2013 if they are on the, the right track going forward. The problem is that we still haven't dealt thoroughly enough with the banking side. We've set up all of the governance structures that we need on the fiscal side, uh, and, and, but we are still lacking the necessary tools and institutions to find ways of, of recapitalizing banks in, in an efficient way. And that gives the, the, the kind of dark cloud that is hanging over Europe much more than, than the fiscal side. Obviously, in, in the longer term, it is it's also a, a growth issue. If you look at unit labor cost development in in, in Sweden uh, compared to Germany, uh, we have actually been able to perform quite decently over the last few years, while the Italians, the Portuguese, the Spaniards and the Italians have been losing competitiveness in a long-term perspective. On average, total factor productivity in Italy has been minus 0.5 since 1995. And it's quite obvious that if you have the same kind of wage increases as, as they have in Germany, you cannot live with the total factor productivity that is falling. And this, I think, is, together with the banking sector, the crucial problem for Europe. We need to get productivity back into the, southern, uh, uh, the Mediterranean countries. They need to fulfill the deregulations and changes that are, are now being implemented, both from, from the Monte government in Italy and, and, and in the, the Rajoy government in, in Spain. And if we go back and just look at the fiscal issue, if you look at the, the fiscal monitor that, that uh, uh, the fund is doing, uh, the net present value of the Italian pension system is now minus 33 when you're looking up to 2020. It is plus 35 in, in the US. So there has been some very fundamental changes in the fiscal setting in Europe and also on the productivity side uh, when the, when, with the deregulations. But this, I think, is much more of the, the long-term problem for Europe than, than the short-term fiscal issues. So I would argue that in the short term, from the European seed, we would, uh, be, it, it, it would be of utmost importance for us to settle uh, the credibility issues in, in the banking sector. And that doesn't have to amount to do that to, to, to large amount of, of money, one should realize that. Uh, given that countries like Spain are running small deficits and very limited current account deficits, we are not talking about the multi-annual program of of the Greek dimensions. We are talking about injecting tier one capital into a couple of banks, which is probably amounting to some 30, 40 billion euros if we are unlucky. But, and that's at least what the media is reporting and, and, and saying. But uh, 
one should realize that that is not that much money in compared to what has already been done for, for Greece and Portugal and, and, and other countries. So the funding in terms of the firewall is there, but we have to get the institutions right to, to solve the problem. And the long-term issue is about total factor productivity, competitiveness, and, and restoring, <coughs> the, restoring the, the, the faith in, in the long-term development. Sweden has weathered this crisis pretty well compared to most others. Our growth numbers have been 1.5% on average uh, for the last five years, which is double the US, uh, uh, well above the Eurozone and, and the EU in general. Our unemployment has increased, as you can see. Uh, I think it is 0.2 higher than it was in, in 2006, so it, it is a slight increase, but not in the neighborhood of what has been seen in some other countries. Our employment growth has been quite spectac spectacular over the last few years, particularly in the private sector. Uh, private sector job growth has been running at quite high rates both in 2010 and 2011, and we still actually see some job growth also with, with uh, the, the, the worse, uh, uh, worsening of, of, of the growth prospects. So basically Sweden has weathered this crisis in a pretty solid manner. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that we've done very substantial structural reforms in our economy. And I will, will argue that that, 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 uh, that is one, one of the main factors here. So let me now go back to the early 90s. Or uh, even, even I think we should think about the 80s, 90s, because we need to see the broad perspective here. In the 80s, Sweden were in a terrible situation. Our growths were lagging behind the rest of Europe. We had lower productivity growth. We had huge problems with uh, cost pressure in, in our economy. Our domestic markets were on overall highly regulated. There was huge barriers to, to entry for entrepreneurs, particularly in the domestic service sectors. Our taxes were, they are still high from American standards, but, but for the Swedish standard, they have reduced, been reduced dramatically. The highest marginal taxes have been cut some 20 percentage point. The average tax rate is probably down uh, uh, substantially above that. I would argue that the average marginal tax is probably down some 25 percent since, since uh, uh, the highest end of, of, of in the 80s. Uh, the business climate in the 80s was very problematic. We had a very intensified political battle between the unions and the business sector where there were proposals to ba basically take over the stocks from the companies uh, and make the unions owners. So many of our absolute best entrepreneurs, the Rousings, the Campras, they moved out of Sweden. So there was a huge uh, problematic situation to start with. And one part of that was the wage setting. We, we had uh, inflational driven wages that was set basically with the public sector as a leader. The state and local governments were the ones that were setting the norm for the rest of the economy. And the fiscal policy was very, very difficult. We had large deficits and the debt level uh, increased. We started out from a very strong position. In the 60s and 70s, we had basically no debt. But, but in, in two decades, we built up a, a, a heavy indebtedness. Uh, the economic, macroeconomic imbalances were really severe. High inflation, poor real wage growth, repeated devaluations, we built up post cost pressure with no productivity, and then de we devaluated the currency. For three or four times since the Bretton Woods crash, we had to devaluate the currency. And that brought up also a rising public debt level and a persistent current account deficit of a rather large magnitude. So this is the starting point in, in the late 80s when, when the reforms start this, started. Uh, and I, let me just give you some, some, uh, some description of, 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 of the kind of imbalances that we saw. Uh, inflation at 10, 11 percentage point can never be sustained without creating imbalances and asset price bubbles. And as you can see, uh, Sweden didn't, uh, came into this from, from, uh, from a long period, well you cannot see that, but from the 50s and 60s, Sweden had been doing very, very well. Uh, very high growth rates, stable prices, strong public finances, good unemployment numbers, uh, and then everything started to change. And one of the most striking facts is that we, from 19, the early 70s to the mid 90s, had no real wage increase. The average wage increase was close to zero for 20 years. 
So Sweden went from, uh, from one of the richest countries in terms of, of purchasing power to number 60, number 15 or something like that. And that is what's happening. I mean, if, if, if you compare uh, the real wage growth from 1990 forward, that it has been 2.3%. And if we would have had that for those 20 years, then our, our consumption level would have been 50% higher. Because that's the effect you get from, 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 from growth numbers. So the starting point was that we had had nominal wages that had produced inflation uh, increases rather than, than real wage uh, uh, increases. Uh, and the public deficit was uh, staggering. Uh, I was working at the Prime Minister's office in, in 91 when we, we came in. And we thought that we were going in 92 to have a deficit of 10 billion Swedish kroner in the first reports that we got in November and uh, December. When we came back after Christmas, Christmas, they were saying 50 billion. In May, it was up to 100. When we came back after the summer, it was 250 billion in the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, forecast. We had gone from uh, almost balance to 13% in deficit in six, seven months. And then everything blew up with the, the, the defense of the currency. And you remember that there was huge outflows. And the, the, the central bank increased the, the, the interest rates up to 500%. That has become legendary to try to defend the currency. And then it broke down. So the starting point was pretty problematic. That's, that's no, uh, uh, I mean, we, we put ourselves in a very, very tough spot. Uh, since then, there has been a period of two decades of consistent reforms and broad-based reforms. While keeping a very well-functioning welfare state, we have been able to transform the labor market so it is much more flexible. We have increased uh, the, the pro production uh, productivity in, in the industry substantially, particularly in the domestic sector. We have cut taxes, we have restored our, our uh, public finances, and we have repaid, basically last year, we repaid the last of our, our current account uh, debt that we built up over the last two decades. And this process has been basically supported by uh, at least 75-80% of the parliament. Broad-based political support is difficult because I was there and there was a lot of political battles of, of, of all the details of this. I mean, it's a little bit uh, uh, creating a, a rationality and the, uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight. But in basic terms today, there is a very broad-based su uh, support for a, a, a very responsible fiscal policy regime. One of the main conclusions from our experience is that any consolidation that will be equal to 5, 10, 15 percent of GDP must be broad-based. You cannot perform such a broad-based fiscal restructuring without using both taxes and revenues. You must deal with the fundamental structure of your expenditures, but you must also be ready to deal with the revenues. And one reason for that is there is no quick fix when it comes to structural reforms. It must be ongoing reforms for a substantial time period, and that means that you need to deal with the social cohesion issue. You cannot have a society where the, the, the conflicts that are built in become so strong that, that you undermine the political ability to deal with problems. If I compare Sweden with, with Spain or Italy and Greece, one of the reasons why we have been able to do this is that our income differences are substantially much lower, which also means that the uh, political tension is on a completely different level. And the tendency that you divide yourselves and dig yourselves into a hole and start to fight, I think to some extent, is, is one of the main risks with fiscal re 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 consolidation. So my experience from Sweden and from Latvia and from Ireland and other countries that I've been involved in in different functions, I would argue that the combination of broad-based and social cohesion is very, very important. Equally important, and even more so in the current situation, the structural reforms to do pro-growth, to be able to grow out of the crisis. You have to deal with the fiscal side, but you must also do the structural side if this is going to be long-term sustained, uh, because uh, obviously the, the growth is, 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 is creating the, the resources. What we did was equal to slightly above 12% of GDP. When I used to give these lectures, we were in splendid isolation with uh, fiscal consolidation in this magnitude. Today, I would argue that there are very many governments in Europe that are doing something that is equal to this. The Latvians have done it, the Estonians have done it, uh, the, the Greeks are on their way to, to perform something, the Irish, uh, the Spanish, and, and so forth. 
R was a balance between revenues and expenditure cuts. Obviously, you must remember that we are coming from a very, very high tax rate to begin with. So you cannot say that there is a one-size-fits-all. One has to go through the details of the specific country and, and obviously try to, to, to balance the reform program. But in general terms, uh, in a European situation where public expenditures are in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 percent of GDP, it is quite clear that uh, uh, most of the consolidation should be taken on, on, on the expenditure side. And obviously, in, if you're in a situation where the tax rates are, are substantially lower, the balance could, could be in, in a different manner. Uh, for example, it was more natural for Latvia to do tax increases than it was for, for Sweden, given that they, they had very low taxes to, to start with. <coughs> I've asked my staffs to put up all the major cutbacks that we did and all the major tax increases that we did to give you a kind of magnitude of the political decision making. We did an overhaul of the pension system. It was started on, or negotiated under the, the crisis years, but then it was implemented uh, from year 2000. Our pension age has in effective term now reached 64.8 uh, years, which is an increase of almost 4% from, from the lowest level. So it was a very strong pension reform where we have created a fully funded, a, full, a partly funded system, but is actuarial in its in its basis, with some automatic breaks for 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 for, for the system. But the transitional reform that we did was basically to lower the indexation of the pension system. That is obviously not very popular among the voters, but the pensions are normally a major part of a transfer system and has to be dealt with. There was also a quite large part that has to do with the transfer system. Early retirement, unemployment insurances, um, uh, 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 health insurances in terms of sickness absentees. In health insurance in Sweden means sickness absence rather than, than health care services. So we transformed basically where the major cutbacks was, what was on transfer payments rather than on welfare services. There were cutbacks in the public sector, almost 10% of, of staff reduction in, in the overall in, in, in our, our welfare services. But the bulk of, of, of the money came from our transfer payments. Uh, obviously that is very painful. Our argument was that you cannot repair an education. If you go through school during the crisis year, you still need a good education. If your unemployment benefit or if your sickness benefits are bad for three months, that's a that sad thing, but it's not the same thing as ruining the healthcare system or ruining the, 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 the education or research and development. So it's to our mind, given that we had a very uh, generous benefit system, it was logical to take the bulk of, of the transformation on, on the transfer system. And given that we had a structural problem on our unemployment market due to high, to high uh, benefits, where a large part of the population, almost a quarter in working ages, were depending on, on different transfer systems. Well, in that kind of situation, it is also a part of a structural reform plan. It is one of the, 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 mm. the, the ways to get people more active when searching for jobs and, 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 and staying on the labor market. So a big part of our transformation to macroeconomic stability was an underpinning of transformation of our social system so that the economic driving forces to search for job and to be on the labor market were, were substantially strengthened. We have also done some very substantial changes that I still benefit from heavily as a Minister of Finance, and that is that we are now setting a large part of the budget in nominal terms. So all grants to local governments is set in nominal terms, and we decide them on a four-year horizon. So that means that uh, obviously if the, these are set, uh, they will not be changed. And that will also mean that um, if you don't put additional reforms, you will actually, in, in terms of GDP, lower your spending on, on, on these sectors. So when I started out working for the government, when we had done all the cutbacks in, in the autumn of 1992, we calculated where we were. And the revenue drift, uh, the expenditure drift was so strong, so what we have been able to do was basically to stop the increase. Uh, we were actually spending more money to 1992 than we did in 1991. So all the cutback decisions taken were basically just to, to, to put the brake on, on an underlying drift that was uncontrollably because we have a lot of things was indexed and, and compensated for. We also did a very smart thing. Well, the public service of Sweden might not agree, but we uh, um, uh, created a system where all public agencies 
will get a wage compensation uh, which is taken from the private sector and we will deduct the average service sector productivity. So the average private sector productivity will be deducted from the wage compensation. So there is a strong demand for the public sector to, to have at least the same productivity increases as, as we have in the, the domestic uh, uh, private sector. And that is also a thing that changes completely the long-term drift of, 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 of the budget. So we have a situation where we can do reforms uh, from a situation where the long-term development of the expenditures are basically under control, which is from a political situation much, much more be better than if, if the automatic systems are, are spending all, all, all the revenues. We also changed uh, uh, substan substantially the, the subsidies to the housing sector. The old Swedish story was that we had 70 or 80 percent marginal taxes and everybody had huge mortgage loans and then the interest rate uh, deduction were, was, uh, was the ones that kept the system going. So we cut the marginal taxes, took away the, 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 the housing and interest subsidies. And, and that had a, a major impact. From a macro policy point of view, that was obviously quite problematic in a situation where we had an asset price deflation because house prices were, were falling. So with the benefit of hindsight, what we now know about asset price deflations, we probably not have done that. But I mean, this was before all of the other countries had tried the similar crises. So uh, 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 there was a need for the long term to reduce the interest rate subsidies and, and that was done. There were also a major increase of tax revenues. Uh, it's, it's difficult to see a strategy in, in this tax increases. In, in Europe today, you basically see two major strands. One is that almost all the crisis countries are increasing VAT. The other is that you are using uh, taxes that you really want to have for allocation purposes, such as CO2, uh, electricity, tobacco, alcohol, where the tax, rate, the tax increases also have some, some other arguments. But I mean, the governments, our governments and the, the next coming government increased quite a lot of taxes because we needed the revenues. Uh, what we tried to do as, as, as far as it was, was to put some of the burden on the better, uh, the ones that were better off, uh, particularly taxing higher wages. It was said that that was going to be a temporary measure, but it's sad to say it's still there uh, 20 years later. So. It was probably necessary for, for social cohesion issues, but one should be always careful with, with, with what, with what is, is supposed to be temporary. So these are some of the, the, the major lessons that I think one should draw. We need to do expenditure cuts. I would still argue that it's better to cut back transfer payments than uh, uh, welfare services. Also for cohesion reasons. It is education that builds social mobility. If you, like in Sweden, can get health care, elderly care, and child care for free, that is a strong compensation for a low income, which means that the, the, the life, life chances are much better distributed. And transfer payments are always uh, difficult because they are, they are undermining the, the, the driving forces to be in the labor market. And in the long-term perspective, it is always the person's ability to, to work and, and to earn income that is basically creating a good life income. It is important that the consolidation measures are acceptable from distribution of income point of view. I will argue later that, yes, we've seen an increase in, in income differences in Sweden, but they are still the low, among the lowest in the world, particularly if we, we take into account the, the welfare spending. So broad-based, expenditure first, think very carefully about social cohesion. We have also changed our framework for budget setting. When the government, uh, I've talked to some of my colleagues that used to have the, the role that I have in the 70s and the 80s, and they described the situation of almost constant budget negotiations. All the spending departments were preparing their, their, uh, their proposals, and they were constantly putting the Minister of Finance under siege and coming and uh, many times per year with, with new proposals. Today, we have one budget negotiation. It is in August. It is based on a full-fledged proposal from my side, and it is based on the fact that we have already set nominal spending ceilings for four years. So this year we will decide the nominal spending ceiling for 2016. So that means that any budget negotiation up till 2016 will have to stick under that spending ceiling. And that creates a situation where the Minister of Finance is proposing the budget. 
and you do a top-down approach based on the macroeconomic assessment, based on what kind of, of structural issues we want to deal with, what kind of welfare reforms that we want to do. And we don't add up from the bottom all the proposals from the spending ministers. And from a very basic public choice assumption, I think it is clear that the spending minister will be a special interest. You shouldn't be the healthcare minister if you don't care for healthcare. You shouldn't be the minister for foreign aid if you don't believe strongly in foreign aid. That's the role, that is what their, 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 their position should be. I would presume that our minister of foreign affairs would fight as vigorously as he can for embassies and, 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 and foreign aid spending. But we cannot do everything. And we cannot have a situation where the tragedy of the commons means that what is rational for the common gets undermined by, by a, a negotiation game. So by starting with setting the nominal spending ceilings for four years ahead, we have an uh, anchor for the whole process that becomes much more responsible. We have also introduced a balanced budget requirement for local governments. And given that schools, healthcare, childcare and elderly care is in the local government, that is a major transformation. That was decided in the late 90s, early 90s, but it didn't come into effect until 2001, I think it was. So the fact has been that we have seen no deficits in the local government since, which means that we don't have the German situation or the Spanish situation where we have one central government uh, deficit that we can control and an unknown entity called local governments that, that are, that are um, uh, uh, creating problems. We have also introduced a, a uh, fiscal policy council that is, is increasing the, the transparency and, and openness in, in the process. Uh, so mainly I would argue that, that uh, uh, we have had a transformation of our budget system. Rules are important, but even more important is actually that all major parties in the P Swedish parliament is supporting uh, uh, responsible fiscal policy. We obviously have a lot of political battles, but they are thought uh, inside a framework where we are sticking to, to stringent budget policies as a, as a starting point. Obviously this could change, but today we have an almost 80-90% support for a balanced budget among the voters. Particularly social democratic voters are pro-balanced budgets. Because if we run into trouble, it will be those who are most depending on welfare services and are most depending on the, the public transfer systems that will be hurt the most. So the fact that the cutbacks were so traumatic to our society. But Sweden is a society that believes in social cohesion and, and welfare states. But because the traumatic experience were so deep, the support today for responsible fiscal policy is, is very, very strong. Among the uh, most frequent letters I get from voters is old women writing and they are saying, Dear Anders, don't put us into deficit. And I can understand from an economist point of view that you could see uh, uh, the need for, for deficit sometimes. But it's a strong position for the ministry in negotiations to know, because what you can bring to the negotiation table is always the political clout that you have. And if you have a strong support, that is obviously much easier. The second half of, of what we did was structural reforms. We've done a major tax reform, and I will give you some numbers so you can see the magnitude here of, of what has happened to the taxes. Uh, they were at close to 50% the average market rates after the tax reform which cut them back very, very substantially. And then we have cut back the taxes uh, on uh, income, particularly earned income. This is obviously not the overall tax level. The overall tax level in Sweden is still very close to slightly below 50%. So we still have a very high tax level. But that is based primarily on VATs and social fees uh, rather than income taxes. So the role for income taxes has been quite dramatically changed in the composition of the taxes. So the marginal effects for a person now working half-time is the average tax for, for a blue-collar job working half-time, or what a lot of females are doing, well, would, would not be higher than 10 to 15 percent. And we are at an average marginal tax rate that is close for a normal person to the OECD average. We were, 10 years ago, an outlier at the top, but for normal income earners, we are now very, very close to the OECD average on, on marginal taxes. Uh, the structural reforms were, were uh, also very much to, to increase competitiveness. There was a very broad-based deregulation. Uh, today, if, the, if you go to the OECD uh, going for growth report, they are looking at eight different sectors. Six out of those, we have less regulatory burden than the US. 
So we have gone from being one of the heavily regulated uh, economies of Europe to one of the least regulated when it comes to product markets. A major shift has been food production and, and, and food retail sales. Because we used to have the highest food prices in the world and we are today below the average for, the, for the industrial countries. Because we open up the retail sector and we deregulate our, 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 our food production. Um, obviously there was also other structural reforms. Pension reform I mentioned. The European Union membership has have lowered the tariffs and opened our economy even further. Uh, we are today uh, well above 50% in, in export. We have changed the central bank system to independent central bank. We, the, the wage setting system has been reformed. And all of these reforms have, have, have uh, strengthened each other. So there is a new sense among the Sweden unions that we are now setting wages so that the competitive sector starts first. And that becomes a norm for the rest of the wage negotiations. We are just finishing a round where the average wage increases are likely to stay between 25 and 3%, which given our productivity levels are very, very reasonable. So we've been able to transform a system where we had no real wage increases to very reasonable real wage and disposable income increases while keeping up the, the macroeconomic stability. One point that I think could be interesting for a US public audience is healthcare. This is how it was. Between 1960 and 1980, Sweden and the US had the fastest increases of cost in the healthcare sector. I was then at the expert committee on public finances and we did a number of studies where uh, the cost increases of healthcare was dramatic, uncontrollable and could not be dealt with. Then we started to do the reforms and we have stuck to 8%. I've asked my staff to look at different diagnoses, particularly cancer diagnoses, where you can, can see the statistics on, on, on quality of, of, of healthcare. There is no argument for the US system. The US is spending twice as much as we on healthcare, and the rates for breast cancer, prostate cancer, or other cancer forms are very similar. We are actually better in some of the diagnoses than the US. We are below the, better than the US average on almost all of them. And we are spending half of what the US is spending on healthcare. And the reforms that we've done, one that was super important was the balanced budget requirement. Because healthcare is now under a balanced budget requirement. They are not allowed to run deficits. We also modernized our budget system. And this is a very, very concrete thing. A diagnosis related payment system changes the whole logic of, of, uh, for, for doctors and hospitals. We used to have a 10 day average in hospital, hospital stay in the mid 80s. That was by far an outlier compared to every other country. We are now in the bottom. So the fact that we've been able to transform the system uh, from a system where you were paid per day in hospital. So the longer the doctors could keep a person in the hospital, the more body he would have to a diagnosis related system has been a tremendous cost cutting in the hospital sector. We have introduced co-payments, so we are now in the top level of the OECD when it comes to the cost of paying for a primary care doctor. So if you have a cold, you will pay uh, 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 around uh, uh, some 10, 20 US dollars. If you would go for a, a mere, more severe diagnosis, you would only have free healthcare. But to go to have a doctor see your cold or talk about your stomach or whatever, that would cost you $20. And we have also set the system so if you come to an emergency hospital and say, well, I have a cold, then you will pay a, a much higher fee. So we are trying to direct the patients to go to primary care rather than to go to emergency hospitals. We have done a major overhaul of our prescription of, 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 of medicine, where we used to have a system where uh, generics doesn't, didn't play a strong role. And that has made it possible for us to have a prescriptive drug spending in our budget unchanged in nominal terms unchanged in nominal terms for almost five to six years now. They have increased slightly uh, over the last period when a lot of medical uh, uh, improvements have, have brought us cost up but in nominal terms they've been very very stable and I, I don't have to tell you that between 1960 and 1990 they were increasing as fast as, as in the US. We have also introduced competition particularly in the uh, primary care sector, where we have a, a free-to-show system for, for the, where the private operators also can, can co compete. And that has been very popular because availability of, of, of primary care, care is important. Uh, the hospital system is to 95% uh, still public. So we have been able to transform the system 
and we are still scoring number four, number five, and two, and three, and one when you lo look at the, the quality of, of care that you're getting uh, and, and compare it to the rest of the, the OECD countries. So that I think is a, a major change in, in, in the Swedish system. Uh, this is what has happened to our uh, revenues and expenditures. We reached a peak uh, at around 60% in expenditures. We have now cut them back down to below 50. We had, as you see, a, a, a strong increase during the crisis. We were up again at 52% in, in uh, expenditure share to GDP because we did a lot of temporary spending in, in 2009 and 2010, so it increased very rapidly. But the bulk of it was temporary, so we are now back in a downwards pattern uh, when it comes to expenditures. Uh, tax levels in Sweden uh, are below the revenue levels because we have a highly profitable uh, public sector. We have the largest uh, <laughs> public industry that, that together with China and, and some other countries, but ours is highly profitable. So the average tax level is, is actually uh, around 45% now and has been uh, falling uh, gradually over the years. So I think uh, 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 we have done pretty well in restructuring our own society. One of the things that I think we have realized during this crisis and which we work with is, is obviously financial stability. I, I will not go into that too much now. Let me though say, because uh, ministers tend to be bragging about their country, and uh, I would also like to mention one severe problem that we are still having so that you don't get the picture that we, we are without problems. And that is basically a very, very high structural unemployment among youth. Our youth unemployment is running over 20% for the last 20 years. Youth immigrants are unemployed to a much higher degree. Sweden is now, in absolute terms, the country that has most immigrants in Europe. In absolute terms, we are receiving as many people as France, uh, uh, England, and, and Germany. And Sweden is uh, uh, around 10 million, and, and France and the UK and the others are among 50, 60, 70 million. Basically, the U.S. is providing these flows for us. You make war and we get refugees. So uh, the, the, the largest uh, ethnic minority in Sweden now is the Iraqis, uh, which is the largest group. We have a very large Iranian group, uh, a large Somali group, uh, quite a large Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistani group. Uh, and we think that this is basically an asset for the Swedish society. And, and we have opened up the borders in a decision from my government in 2008, which has brought also a lot of Chinese, Indians, and, and, and Russians uh, who, who come to, to, to work for us. But we do have a structural problem uh, in, in the labor market. And it, it has to be dealt with because it is quite clear that it's inherent in the Swedish model. If you have compressed wages, where the lowest wages are quite high, uh, it is likely that you push people out of or to unemployment. Historically, we've been able to deal with it because we were a very homogeneous population and have had a very, very good uh, education system. But we don't, we don't, our education system has not performed as it should over the last decades. Look at France, uh, look at, at Germany, Austria, or, or the Netherlands. They have had youth unemployment running at four, five, six percent, and they are also welfare states. They also have unions. They also have taxes. But what they do have is an apprentice system, an education system that creates a, 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 a path into the labor market. And this is a major issue for us now to try to, to change. We will obviously try to work together with the unions on these issues. I, I, I have met something like 70 different unions since uh, 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 the last month to start a broad-based negotiation in the autumn where we can see some new system to, to, add, to, 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 to introduce people to the labor market without lowering the overall wage level. Because given our competitiveness, we don't need to cut wages in Sweden. We can afford wage increases. But there is a problem that the introductory wages in combination with uh, very strict employment protection rules, high costs in terms of collective bargaining, is pushing youth unemployment up. And we need to do something about that in terms of wage subsidies, in terms of agreements with the unions where we are changing this structure and we need to introduce an apprentice system. We cannot have a, a vocational training system that, that, that doesn't give people the competence to get a job. When we started out this prospect, process, there was a lot of people who said that this cannot be done without increasing economic differences. This is from Divided We Stand, the OECD report on, on economic income equality. Sweden is, uh, if you take into account the fact that we provide public services for free, the country with the least income differences. Together with the Nordic countries, we are also the country with the highest degree of social mobility. 
where the father's education has the less, least impact on the son's uh, education and, and, and work career. So we have a high degree of social mobility. And if you look at the people that are worst off in material terms, where in absolute poverty, we together with the Nordic countries have the least problem with, with severe deprivation of, of, of material resources. Sweden, Norway, Denmark has been able to combine fiscal stability, monetary stability. A lot of people were saying if you change and go for low inflation, you will have a society that will be haunted by income differences. We have reinvigorated the economy with much better productivity growth, much stronger competitive in product markets without increasing income differences. A lot of people were saying, yeah, it's not, it's not a dynamic society, but it's, a, it's an equal society. Well, it, today it is both equal and dynamic. And we've been able also to reform our labor market, where we have cut, according to the estimates, the structural unemployment rate some 1.5 to 2%, without undermining the social cohesion of our society. So the lesson for us is that there is no necessary conflict between having a society with a high degree of social cohesion and a society that is macroeconomic stable and also can combine that with good growth numbers. So thank you very much for, for listening to this. Thank you.